All right, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, here today is our webinar on scalability uh, by decisions. So a frequent question that we hear at decisions is how can you scale to meet your business or how can we scale to meet your business requirements? Sometimes this means managing a large number of concurrent users on a website, you know, but other times it means processing millions of records through complex rules built in our rules engine. Some customers simply want to know if we can dynamically scale to meet intermittent demand. The answer to all these questions is yes, yes, and yes. For example, a large financial services company processes maybe 50 million transactions a month through thousands of rules. For a large manufacturing customer, we process 10,000 messages per second to provide real-time feedback to maintenance technicians in the field. And we even have another financial services company that onboards over 40,000 customers per day and uses our rules engine to provide real-time validation and on those rules, and they execute in less than 50 milliseconds. Now, for those of you who are new to decisions, before we, we jump in too much further, you know, I just want to say we are a business process management software that helps non-technical people to easily automate and optimize business processes without the need to code. Now on this slide, we just have some of our current customers in different sectors to give you an idea of where decisions fits. So we are equal parts rules engine and workflow. So there's a lot of different problems that we can solve across a multitude of different industries. And again, here are our lovely headshots. So you can match a name with a face. And we have had the pleasure of meeting many of you guys on webinars or video calls in the past, but now we're about to discuss some of our upcoming events. Uh, so come and experience us virtually. Uh, we also wanna mention, you know, we welcome connections and questions on LinkedIn. So please feel free to add us there. Now, later this month from February 22nd through the 26th, we will be hosting our associate certification course. This is the second level of certification in our tool and is designed to certify that a user has the ability to build projects with both process oriented data and non process oriented data. Uh, just please know before signing up for this course, you must have passed our fundamental certification prior to the start date. On February 25th, we will be hosting a webinar all about work queues and decisions. So if you're interested in how to handle multi-threaded processes and decisions and how to put work into queues for multiple servers to work on tasks, I highly recommend you sign up for this event. Now the first week of March, we will be offering a beginner training course in the Eastern time zone. And this is a great opportunity if you're looking to get your feet wet in the tool whether you're an existing customer or maybe you're just evaluating our platform. Uh, and again, that's gonna be from March 2nd through the 4th. Now, later in March, we will be having another fantastic webinar all about mobile forms. And as many of you may or may not know, uh, in version seven, our form designer has had a major overhaul. So we'll be exploring that throughout this webinar. And also if your company has been thinking about making your applications or forms mobile friendly, please come check it out to learn about how to achieve the exact look and feel you're looking for from a mobile application. And we always have lots of opportunities to train and learn about decisions virtually and safely anywhere where you might may find yourself around the globe. So please be sure to sign up for any of those events that I mentioned at decisions.com slash events. Now, before diving directly into the content, I wanna briefly go over today's agenda for anyone watching who might be wondering what scalability is, uh, no worries, don't panic. We are going to start by defining exactly that. And once we understand what scalability is, Tim will be walking us through different types of scalability, uh, such as vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, and dynamic scaling. After learning about the different types of scaling, we'll be walking through a few examples of how to determine which type of scaling is needed and when that scaling might be right for you. As always, we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end uh, where we'll be answering your questions live. Now, speaking of Q&A, uh, if everyone could take a look at their Zoom panel, it should look just like the picture on the slide. You'll be able to chat with decisions team members utilizing the chat feature, or if you utilize the raise your hand function, someone on our team will reach out to you during the webinar. 
And of course, you can always use the Q&A feature for questions as well. Now, finally, I wanna point out the polls feature. Uh, so this is to answer our interactive polls as we continue on with our presentation. And I'm about to throw up another poll right now. So go ahead and take a couple of moments to answer that. Maybe. All right, so that second poll should be up. Everyone can go ahead and take a look at that. And Tim, I'll turn the floor over to you. Sounds good, I appreciate it. So as, as we were saying earlier, you know, a lot of folks come to us saying, can you scale to meet our business needs? And what I wanna really start with is, is just a quick overview of what defines scalability. So what is it and, and why would you be concerned about it in your particular company or your particular process? So scalability kind of boils down to two, two major things here, either the ability to increase performance. So, you know, certain processes and applications you're running might exceed what that base specification is on your server, for instance. And scalability is how the users can grow, you know, your infrastructure to accommodate that additional load. So think about this, if you had a, a process that you wrote where users were submitting forms or maybe you were running rules against some data, the amount of users may have started about 10 to 50. And then all of a sudden, you know, Kami does well, the company's doing great and your, your company expands to now 10,000 users. And scalability is what you can use to, and to bring that process from how you originally defined it to handle that additional load. So it's also, the ability to, to increase availability. So when you talk about scaling, one of the main one of the main ideas behind it is giving you the ability to uh, achieve high availability. And what I mean there is, if you have processes that are mission critical, you may not have the luxury of having them down. And one of the things you can do with scaling is employ additional servers in a clustered mode. So that way, should one server fail, you still have another one taking requests. So if you think about the, the idea behind our process starting with 10 users and growing to 10,000, well, when it was 10 users, you know, if the system went down for a period of time, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes, it wasn't really that, you know, business impacting. But when it scales up to 10,000, that could be, you know, complete downtime for the company and cost quite a bit of money for you. So in scalability, you can increase the number of servers so that way you have redundancy and should something fail, you can, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, having the, the company completely out. So some other concepts to know, you know, you can think of, of some of the, the things around scalability as far as, you know, a procurement workflow. So you started this workflow in one department, but now it has to handle the entire company. Or you had rules that were built to handle 20 clients, but now they have to handle 200. Or even better, a process that was used in one region in the world and now is worldwide. Scalability, whether it's whether it's you know one of the three types we're going to talk about today, can help you solve and deal with these complex issues. So some of the concepts that we'll go over today will be, you know, scalability must be planned for during process architecture. And what I mean here is when you're developing your particular process or application. If it's something that you know is going to grow in the future, there are certain steps that we can use within decisions and certain avenues we can take within our platform that can help you achieve those, those scaling needs down the road. So as you're building it out, and we'll go through some examples later, you can use some certain steps and you can swap them out for other ones. So that way you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel when you get to uh, the need to scale things up or out but you have a great foundation that's ready to handle and, and help you handle those tasks. So our software, you know, offers many ways to handle a similar task, but not all can grow to accommodate an expanding user base. The great thing though, is we do have other steps within the toolbox that again, you can swap them in and out. And scalability also does not always mean additional servers or licensing. So there are ways that you can scale such as clustering that would, but there are other ways you can scale up your, your processes that will use the same system and the same license you currently have. So now the first of those three is one I, I'm gonna start with and it's called vertical scaling. So vertical scaling, it is as simple as this. It is, it's increasing 
the amount of, of memory or CPU storage capacity or, or bandwidth that that particular server has. So it's like taking taking your system and saying, you know, I've got, you know, four cores and, and I've got, a, you know, 16 gigs of RAM and, and all of a sudden it's running slow. I need to be able to support more users. Well, you can simply add additional, you know, additional RAM, additional processor, you know, cores or, or capacity to it. And that is what's called vertical scaling. And that'll give you that extra room, that extra room in your server that you can handle additional processes and run, you know, maybe instead of having one process run, you could have 40 processes <laughs> running at once. So the benefits for this, it does not affect your decisions license. So simply scaling up the, the amount of resources your server has doesn't affect the license. It does allow uh, for a response to growing needs without changing the architecture. So, you know, you're not going, you know, going back to your, your DevOps folks and saying, oh, you know, I need a, a new system and we have to have a load balancer and all this other stuff you have to take into consideration. It, it's simply increasing those specifications. And it also, when we talk about architecture changes, it doesn't require any changes to the process you've developed either. So you have your process in place, you've built it, it works, it does everything you need. It's just, it's just not able to keep up with demand anymore. Well, we just add more RAM and CPU to the server and, to, and, and allow that to, to uh, grow into that. So again, minimally invasive, doesn't take design time work to complete. It's, it's all on the back end, and it's independent of flows and rules. This is simply a hardware change in this case. So some of the drawbacks though, it can require hardware purchases. So it may not be a software purchase, but it could require additional hardware purchases just depending on, on your particular environment and architecture. Um, it can require downtime to implement. So you may have to you know, take the system down, add those additional resources and bring it back up. So it's something you do need to be aware of. It does not achieve high availability. So just by adding additional resources to that one server, you know, you don't have a redundant environment. You don't have the ability to handle, you know, those outages. And it does have a point of diminishing returns. So as you're scaling a system up, there comes a point where it doesn't matter how much resources you put in there, it, it simply is not going to be able to handle that particular load. Now, with that, that brings us to our second topic, which is horizontal scaling. So Horizontal scaling is adding additional nodes or adding additional servers. So where vertical is taking the one server that we had and adding more resources to it, horizontal scaling is saying copy paste. I have one server, now I have two or I have three or I have you know, the four, five or six. You know, um, It consists of putting more servers to work on that same process. So they're spreading the load out. So more nodes or more servers means more workers that are able to take requests process data and rules, output results, work with end users. And decisions clustering using our enterprise license is one way to horizontally scale the platform. So the benefits of this, it can support a very large and complex process or platform. Um, you know, when, when you start talking about horizontal scaling, you know, you can have, you know, many, many more users simultaneously accessing the system. If you think of some of the major software providers out there or websites out there that you utilize on a daily basis, they, they have an immense amount of horizontal scaling where you have systems placed all over the world that are working on the same data. You know, if you access you know, one particular social media platform in Virginia and access the same platform in California, I guarantee you're talking to different servers in those two locations, but you wouldn't know the difference because of that clustering, that horizontal scaling. So it does support higher uptime as each node can be managed or patched independently. So where before, if I had to you know, patch my system or you know, upgrade the RAM or do Windows updates, whatever the case may be, you know, it requires downtime for me to do that. And that process is offline while I'm performing that maintenance. Now, in this case, you could take one node down. If you have, if you have two servers or two nodes running, you could take one down, perform all that maintenance, perform all that patching, bring it back up, and then take the other one down, and you haven't had any downtime in your process. It simply keeps running. And, and again, for, for uh, you know, our global customers, it does allow for placement of systems in regions where there's higher demand. So put the servers near the customers, you know, wherever they're accessing it from, get those systems that, you know, closer to them. And that can also help reduce any kind of uh, performance issues as well. 
Now, some of the drawbacks, um, of course, there it does require a more complex server and systems architecture. You know, when we're talking about horizontal scaling, you're talking about not only the, the decisions servers itself and, and the licensing associated with it, but you're talking about load balancers and you're talking about storage and, and, a, and, a, and a couple of other things. Not to say that this is anything that's insurmountable, but it is something to be aware of. It does require developing some processes to be cluster aware already. There's not a lot you have to do, but there are a couple things you do want to consider when doing this. And it does have an impact on the license, of course. It requires our, our enterprise agreement, and there is a, a per server cost with that. So the third, the third topic with scaling, or the third type of scaling, is dynamic. And this one has been a real hot topic lately. But dynamic scaling, and, and I even put their logo there because they're the, they're the company that comes up all the time. Um, dynamic scaling says, I need to be able to adjust the amount of server resources I have to fit the current demand. So if I have 10 users accessing the system right now, I may only need one server. If I all of a sudden have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 accessing it, I need a way that I can you know, immediately deploy more resources to my, to my pool of resources. But then once that resources, you know, once that demand diminishes, then I can start pulling them out. So, you know, when a process can adjust the amount of nodes available or adjust the memory, CPU storage capacity on demand, it's said to be dynamically scaled. So, you know, this is actually another method of horizontally scaling your platform. So some of the benefits, again, this is, this is, we're talking containers here. This is using containers to do that, that dynamic scaling. They provide extremely dynamic performance uh, scaling based on, you know, set requirements and process demands. You can say, hey, you know, if this process is running great, I always want to say at maybe 50% of whatever resources I have. And if all of a sudden I get demand and I have, you know, all these extra rules running and all these people using my system that I, you know, weren't using it 10 minutes ago, deploy more, you know, of these containers to the pool and increase the amount of resources available. You know, when you're talking about these resources, you know, if you're talking about you using an, an, an Amazon and Azure, one of those hosting providers, you know, compute resources are, are only going to be billed when those containers are active. So this is a great way to get that balance between, you know, there's, there's times where my process isn't really used, you know, maybe at night, it's not being used. Maybe that, you know, it, it starts peaking about 8am and, and drops off about 5pm, you know, a standard process with a lull around lunchtime. Well, with dynamic scaling, you can adjust that on the fly and you can even you can even have it set up where it's done automatically so that way as need increases the amount of you know compute your build for will increase because the amount of containers increase and as the needs drop off then that that uh, compute resource will drop off and you won't be built for it because they're no longer in service so you know processes can scale to meet your demand in seconds or minutes, you know, compared to building an additional server, adding it to a cluster, you know, dealing with all of that. This, this dynamic scaling can really start helping solve a lot of those complex issues around uh, performance. Now, some of the drawbacks, processes do require special configuration and use cases to support a containerized environment. Currently, not everything that, that can be done in the system can be done in containers. There, there are specific use cases around rules and, and workflow that can, that can uh, really help offset uh, performance problems. When we're talking about our, our, our manufacturing uh, company that you know, scaled up to you know, a million transactions a day, you know, that, that process is using containers to do the work of rules processing, of workflow. So it's taken that real high, high intensity, high compute uh, uh, resource and running it against multiple containers and it, it really increased the performance dramatically at, at, that, at that particular client. So the containers still require the, the database backend and they do require the application server as a controller. So in, in a containerized or a dynamically scaled environment, you're looking at a decisions application server like you normally would have with its database behind it. And that acts as the controller for all of the containers that are out in the field that are in your pool that are doing the work. And then the last bullet point here I, I put in because I come from IT is, you know, your IT staff must be cognizant and aware of container setup and maintenance, you know, to reduce or eliminate downtime in there. 
So, you know, the dynamic scaling and containerization isn't necessarily the magic switch. There is also, you know, some, some, uh, some work that needs to be done in IT to handle uh, containers and be able to support that in the future. So with that being said, our next uh, section here, we're going to go into some examples of these three different types. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you, Tim, for that, that great overview of each of the types of scaling that we have. Uh, what we're going to walk through now is um, kind of a, a fictitious company or a fictitious scenario. Uh, now, the numbers that we'll be showing you guys, these are our actual numbers that we did during this performance testing. Um, but the, the scenario we'll be going through is uh, we have a company, Swipe Right, who is a growing company that categorizes and augments credit card transactions for rewards programs. Now, Jane has been tasked with coming up with a two-part plan to scale their existing environment to handle the expected influx of transactions. Uh, Jane needs to determine the most cost-efficient way to scale their existing environment over the next 12 months. This plan must account for being able to handle 500,000 transactions in an hour uh, in six months from now, and also the ability to handle 1 million transactions per hour 12 months from now. Now, to provide a little bit of context here, each transaction that's being processed on average is going to go through six, about six different flows, 38 different rules, there's about 18 different flow steps, and each of those transactions also includes a database uh, lookup. Now with these numbers in mind, let's take a look at how Jane set up her current environment to do testing to see how much their existing setup can handle. So in order to test SwipeRight's current environment, uh, which looking at this diagram we can see is a single server with four cores and has 16 gigabytes of RAM, Jane set up a message queue with the current server and loaded it with 1 million messages or transactions. Now, the reason that Jane set up this message queue was to allow decisions to continuously pull these messages or transactions as fast as it can to test it at its peak performance. Now, keep in mind that you could use a tool like JMeter to also simulate this behavior for testing, um, but Decisions does recommend using a message queue to handle large numbers of transactions. So why not go ahead, set up that message queue while you're doing your testing so that you can keep that in place uh, moving forward with your architecture. Now, after allowing Decisions to process these messages, uh, Jane found that with the current setup, they can handle about 97 and a half transactions per second, a little less than 6,000 transactions per minute, and about 350,000 per hour. So looking at this, Jane knows that when that six month mark rolls around, they will need to scale in some way to handle that expected volume. So let's take a look at scaling vertically first. Let's see if this is going to meet uh, their requirements. Now, looking at this diagram, the only thing Jane had to do here uh, was increase those server specs or beef up those server specs. Uh, so here we've just increased it to eight cores and 64 gigabytes of RAM without changing anything else. And keep in mind with this type of scaling, this is not gonna affect your licensing and it's not gonna require any additional servers. So again, uh, Jane loaded up that message queue with 1 million records and let decisions have at it, just pulling those transactions and processing them as fast as they can. So looking at Jane's findings, we can see a big increase in the transactions processed. So here we're at about 192 per second, uh, a little over 11,000 per minute, and a little under 700,000 per hour. So this is great news for Jane, but it's still not qu quite hitting that 1 million per hour mark that's gonna be needed in 12 months time. So with this in mind, Jane knows that she also needs to explore horizontal scaling. So looking at the architecture in this diagram, Jane has configured a load balancer to sit in front of uh, the servers. Uh, each of these servers has the eight cores and 64 gigabytes of RAM. And the load balancer is acting as a gateway between the clients and the servers and it's routing the messages or transactions to the first server available to process the next message. 
Now this time, Jane loaded up uh, the message queue with 2 million records for testing. And again, just let that clustered environment have at it, uh, pulling those messages and processing them as fast as they can. Now with this setup, swipe right would be able to handle 384 transactions per second, 23,000 uh, per minute, and over 1 million per hour. So what is Jane to do? Well, to take the most cost-effective approach, Jane is gonna recommend that in order to handle the influx in six months, they can simply start with vertically scaling their existing server to have higher specs without the need to purchase an additional license for an additional production server. Now in 12 months time, her recommendation would be to upgrade to an enterprise license, which will include two production servers that can be configured in that clustered environment. Now, keeping these findings in mind, later down the road, if they need to continue to horizontally scale uh, with that same process in mind, Jane can do some simple math to add additional servers to the cluster as needed. So, for example, by adding a third server into the mix, Jane knows that the transaction time is going to jump to about 2 million records an hour. Or additionally, you know, you could vertically scale each one of those existing servers to the increased specs. So, you know, going, drawing it back here, scaling processes and decisions. So, you know, we've looked at, you know, just from a, a specifically hardware perspective, how we can, you know, handle those things, you know, using vertical or horizontal scaling. But when we start talking about scaling processes and decisions, there are a number of methods that are baked into the platform that you can use in your workflows and use in your processes to achieve these particular outcomes that we just discussed. So we have things like, we talk about message queues. So those are, those are other systems that simply hold, a, 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 a hold transactions. So you can have a, you know, all of your systems pointing at that. That system will hold every transaction as kind of an envelope. And it's waiting for a decision server to come in, take that envelope, pull it down, run whatever that processing is and, and push it out to the next, next uh, section. And decisions has native integrations to most of the mainstream uh, message queues that are out there. We also have the steps in the toolbox that you can use. And one of them that we pointed out here is a step called run flows for list. And what this does, and we'll, we have a, a diagram of it on another slide here, but what this does is this allows you to kick off multiple uh, threads for a single job. So instead of, if, I have a, if I've gotten a list of items that I have to iterate through and one by one, I have to take one off the top and work on it and move to the next one, Run flows for list says, give me this whole list and you tell me how many processes I need to run at the same time. And it'll just go, it'll pull a chunk off, process it, and then it'll keep, you know, keep pulling messages off. So it has those, those same amount running in parallel. The same thing can happen with threads. So we have, uh, you know, our asynchronous steps and some of the other ones that allow you to, you know, increase the number of threads for a process. So that way you can, again, run things in parallel on that single server. Uh, asynchronous flows can go out there and start kicking off processes on things like containers. So you can use, you can tell decisions, you know what, I've got, you know, 500,000 messages here and I want you to run 500 at a time uh, asynchronously and go out and give them to the containers and it'll start going. And, and all of these steps are built right into the, st the same steps toolbox that you use for all of your other processes. And then finally we have work queues. Now I'm just going to touch on this. We do have a, a webinar coming up on this one here in a couple of weeks, but work queues are built into the enterprise module and they allow you to tell certain servers to listen to certain work queues. So you could have multiple decisions instances, each one listening to a work queue and pulling transactions from there. And, you know, these things that Tim Tim are talking about, like being able to add run flows for list step into your process, this is these are all things that can be accomplished, or most of these things that he's talking about can be accomplished using the workflow designer, a designer that you already feel comfortable working in. Uh, you might you know you might not know how to architecturally scale, but when you're designing your workflows or your work in the workflow designer, you can also build keeping scaling in mind as well. And again, that's that same workflow designer that you already feel comfortable working in. 
there's not a custom scaling designer that you have to learn. Um, and, and for those of you who are new to decisions or, or might not have worked in decisions before, these designers that we're talking about, they're all no code uh, visual drag and drop designers. And that's something that is unique to decisions, the ability uh, to handle the scaling within these, these no code visual designers. Now, if we take a, take a look at this standard workflow that we have here, it might be hard to see what's happening, but uh, essentially what we're doing is we're fetching some financial data from a database. We're using a for each step to individually loop through each one of the items in that financial data list that was returned. And one at a time, we're going to run it through a rule to see if it meets that criteria. If it does meet the criteria, uh, maybe we'll calculate an APR percentage. Once that's been calculated, we're going to loop back. We're going to go grab the next item in that list, and then we're going to run that rule, uh, calculate that APR, so on and so forth for each item in the list. Now, after that, our process might go ahead and run a report with those updated financial statements. Now, in this paradigm, this is something that's happening, happening sequentially. It's not going to get or it's not going to process all of these items at one time it's going to individually process them. Now, Tim, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you and show us, you know, what, what can we do to handle this in a workflow designer? How can we scale this process in our workflow designer? Well, so what we've done here is we took the exact same process that we had on the left and we broke it into two processes on the right. So by moving all of the, the, uh, the rule and that sum step into their own workflow, what I'm able to do is use the run flows for list step instead of my for each. So instead of running, in this case, one transaction at a time, I can run multiple transactions at a time. So I can say, when you've grabbed all that data, I want you to run in a certain way. And the, some of the, the configuration options for that run, list, run flows for list step are down there at the bottom. I can tell it, you know, how many threads do I want you to run in? You know, are you working against a certain work queue? So can I spread this out amongst multiple servers, um, et cetera? So all of that is, is just a simple change. I used one different step and then moved the other two just into another workflow. And now I've taken, you know, my process and now it's completely able to be scaled across multiple systems. And also, even on the same system, you're able to, to process more transactions at once. So it's very simple. Again, all this is drag and drop, all done with the, the uh, workflow designer that we, we all use for all the other processes. It's simply by rethinking how you set it up. Excellent point, Tim. Now, up to this point, you know, we've talked about how to scale your processes and decisions. But you know, there's probably a, quite a few of you on the line wondering, well, how do I scale for more users? And Tim, how, how do we scale for more users? Yeah, and that's a good point. You know, it depends on the amount of users you have. Um, when you're talking, you know, going from 10 to 50 or 50 to 100, vertical scaling is probably a great way to do that. Now, you do have to consider, are we using the forms? So are we displaying forms to users, or are they simply using processes, looking at dashboards, et cetera? So all of that's going to play a factor into it. But again, we do have those two different methods, one being vertical scaling and the other one being clustering. Now, again, the requirements for these are, are you could, you know, when you're moving from, from uh, you know, vertical to clustering, you, you would have an architecture change. So it's something to be aware of that as you grow in your users, you know, we would have to look at, you know, adding additional servers or, or requiring uh, adding additional resources to the servers then. And that, that's great, Tim, but how do I know, you know, how many users do I know, you know what, it's time to either scale vertically or it's time to scale horizontally? You know, is it a magic number? Is it once I have 50 users, I need to scale? Is it once I have 1,000 users, I need to scale? How, how many users? Well, you know, that that is the question we get asked all the time. And again, I say it depends on your environment, but, you know, what I, what I can say is, you know, we do, uh, we do do something called eat our own dog food here. <laughs> so if anybody has ever used support.decisions.com, this is a clustered environment of decisions. 
So there are, you know, we have over about 200 employees now. We have about 200 plus customers that are all over the globe accessing these two systems. There's only two servers in there um, from all over the globe, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, there is no magic number. It really depends on your environment. But for us, you know, we're able to, to do this easily with, with this amount of, of load. Now, when you see this, you're like, okay, well, that's just support tickets, right? Well, what's interesting about this is this, this support system is not just the customer facing support system that you're used to seeing, should you ever you know, work with support. We also do, you know, we have just our support ticketings in there. So all of our employees use that. We have our own internal processes like HR. Um, we have our customer account management. So all the information about our customers and how they operate. Um, and even our, our develop, you know, our development pipeline is managed through this. So task management, you know, what features are currently in the queue, who's working on them, who's tasked with them. And even our QA department uses it to manage testing for all of our releases. So this system is used very, very heavily. And even with that kind of load, we're sitting with simply two servers within that cluster. Awesome. So with that, I know we had um, some questions that were coming in from the chat, from the Q&A. Um, I was like, go ahead and we can use this time to, to answer those. I would say if anybody has any others, please feel free, open up the question and answer, pop them in there. We'll be more than happy to, to go over them. Um, I'm gonna start with one that's in our chat here. Um, it says, so your horizontal solution uh, assumes that CPU is the bottleneck, correct? Um, so we're either creating clusters of compute network IO, um, however, your database remains a single point of contention. So uh, at the bottom, it says, how do you scale data IO, particularly if SQL becomes the bottleneck? You know, in a container where SQL is running and the container outside the container, you know, when we start talking about scaling data, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of what we talked about today was where the CPU was the bottleneck. A lot of the times when we're talking about processing rules and transactions, that transactional data at that point is handled within memory on the systems that are in the cluster. So we're not doing a lot of reads and writes back and forth to the database. This is simply, you know, processing um, um, transactions. You know, when you start talking about uh, scaling data and I.O., there are, uh, you know, things out there such as RDS that allows you to scale SQL Server. Um, again, you can scale it vertically, you can scale it horizontally. Um, I do understand that you, you do have some complexities with you know, transactions, acid compliance, et cetera, but a lot of those can be mitigated with those, those um, enterprise grade SQL environments that you can get from some of the big players. So I don't, you know, there's not a, a definite 100% uh, answer for you on that, but I know that's what we've used in the past to settle and, and handle some of those issues with some of our other clients. We have another uh, question in our Q&A uh, from Michael. So will the run flow for list in a cluster spread the work across multiple nodes for a single package of work? Or is it done all on the server that starts the work? That's a great question, Michael. So with the run flows for list, there are all kinds of uh, levers and knobs that you can uh, turn and tweak to make uh, either that single server handle the load or you can do things like uh, put that work in a work queue where each server in your cluster can pull the work from that queue when it's ready to process. So you can absolutely, uh, with that step, you can use multiple nodes to handle that, that work. Great question. Awesome, okay. We'll, we'll leave the Q&A open here for just another second. And if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A. Or feel free to raise your hand if you're typing. <laughs> okay. Well, seeing none, what I'll say is, you know, feel free to all the time uh, reach out. Oh, I do see we had one, one come in. Just one second here. <laughs> Okay, let's see, I see our flows are driven by service bus queues. Uh, and so how does the active flow count factor into adding more nodes into the cluster? Interesting, so when, when you're using flows that are driven by your, your bus queues, um, it, 
it's going to depend on how you architect it and how you pull the messages down and how you set decisions up in your workflow to handle that those transactions. So for each message, for example, you know, you can tell decisions, how many, how many messages am I going to process? You can say how many, once I pull that message down, how many threads am I going to run uh, based on that particular, um, based on that particular message that comes in. So it, it really, I, I hate to leave it with the pens, but it really depends on your architecture, how that's set up. But I do know that we have a, a lot of different users using uh, uh, service buses or message queues to handle large amounts of transactions um, using those steps that we mentioned uh, here today on the webinar. So I see we have a question. Uh, we currently have uh, two nodes set up, but all our scheduled jobs is being triggered. Uh, by the primary job server, but there is no way to tell if the second node is being used by the triggered flows uh, from the jobs. And what I would say on that one is there there are ways to tell that, but that would be a great question for support. If you, if you put a ticket in there, they can help you look at that workflow and, and how it's how it's set up and how that scheduled job is set up. And then they can help you go and find where that is within your environment. So we can pinpoint where that job's running and show you how to see where that is. Um, again, that's going to be uh, possibly a little different per environment. So I would say, please feel free to reach out support at decisions.com and, and ask them that question. They'll be able to get on a call with you and, and, and look that up. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also add as well, um, you know, with the with your scheduled jobs, there is a setting uh, that allows you to tell tell it which work queue you want the scheduled job to run on and and support will definitely help you with that. And I also see, you know, if instances are different on the server, how does a cluster know which instance to route to? Um, so that again, that's going to depend on your setup, right? So with with the instances, your when you set up a cluster, you're telling it which systems are part of that cluster. So which instances are part of that cluster. Um, if you had different ones, I, I don't know that they would necessarily be in the same cluster. Um, but I think that one, you know, just like in, in our previous question, I would probably recommend reach out to support and, and ask that if that's a specific need in your environment. Because in, in, my, in my experience, you know, when you have a cluster set up, they're all the same instance, they're just, in a clustered uh, uh, fashion at that point. Okay. Well, everybody, we appreciate you all joining us today um, and, and joining us for our webinar today. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us either at support at decisions.com or sales at decisions.com. Uh, Jessica just uh, set up our poll on the way out the door. If you don't mind uh, letting us know what you thought. And you know, from Chesapeake, Virginia, we are signing off and we hope you all have a wonderful day.